Turks rally. It is so good to see you here this morning. I know we're spending some time with Jesus as our good shepherd this morning. And Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And I know if you spend time reading in David, he just wants to be in God's house and in his presence. That's his idea of the perfection of eternity. So won't you stand with us this morning as we start saying, I
Good morning. Good morning. Every Sunday, we share a greeting with each other, with one another. It's not just to show that we're friendly with each other and that our relationships are good, but it's also an expression of our relationship with the Lord. And um, we're gathering at the table, the Lord's table today. And the Bible says that when we do that, let's just make sure we examine our hearts before we come. And what the Bible means is that let's make sure that we're at peace and at grace with one another. So we share this greeting weekly. We say the words grace and peace. Grace means may God treat you better than you deserve. And peace means may God take whatever's broken in your life and put the pieces back together. So if you feel comfortable, turn to a neighbor and share those words. Grace and peace. We're going to continue the worship by giving back to God as we receive an offering this morning. This is our opportunity to give back to God. We add our financial gifts to the rest of our gifts of worship today. We give cheerfully and generously to God who has given so much to us. By the way, if you're a guest, just want you to know there's no obligation to give today as our church is supported by our regular members and friends. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our good shepherd, receive these gifts from we who have received far more from you than we could ask or imagine because of your love for us in Jesus. Please would you bless these gifts we give back to you today. Your kingdom may grow and flourish here and everywhere. Amen.
kids. Come on up, kids. Good morning. Let's let's sit right here. No, no. There we go. Okay. Um. Well, it's still Easter, right? Do you remember that? Do you remember how many Sundays there are in Easter? Close. Seven. Exactly right, Lexi. And how many days of Easter in the whole season of Easter? I mean, there's the big first Sunday when we have the Easter egg hunt, but there's 50. 50 days, everybody. Seven Sundays. And this is the fourth Sunday of Easter. And today, there's a story that we're going to be talking about. And before we do it, let me see if you can guess what animal this sound is. Ready? Everyone close their eyes. <laughs> Ready? That's my best animal sound right there. <laughs> it is an elephant. Exactly. As I told you, it was a good animal sound. How many of you can make... Want to hear that one again? Yeah. Now, I bet all of you can make an animal sound. How many know what a lamb says? <laughs> That's right. Do you know that Jesus said, all of my people are like my lambs. And I don't know about you, but they all sound alike to me. <laughs> they all sound the same. But Jesus said, I know every one of my lambs, and I know them by name, and they know me. Isn't that amazing? Jesus can tell. And we're Jesus' lambs. I want to show you a picture from my, you know, my favorite book that I always bring. It's my Bible with pictures in it. And that is a picture of God. Well, it's a picture of what God is like. God, you see that? So you can see that? God is like a shepherd who looks after his lambs. And do you see what he's got there? He's got something called a staff with a hook on it. And that staff helps him grab a lamb that's in trouble and pulls him away from a, a rocky place or a bush that's really prickly or something like that. And do you see this picture right here? You have to look closely. Do you see that picture right there? There's the staff. Do you see that? That's the staff, the long one. What's that? <coughs> that's the staff right there. But look at that stick. What is that one? That's a rod. They call that a rod. Now, we don't maybe have shepherds today, at least not many. But in the Bible, they had a staff and a rod. The staff was to help rescue some lambs that were in trouble. And the rod, who knows what the rod was for? It was to protect against wild animals that might eat the lambs. Jesus said, I will both protect you from things that might harm you, and I'll also keep an eye on you and rescue you if you're in trouble. Isn't that good to know? Jesus promised that for his lambs. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you are our shepherd. Thank you that Jesus will protect us from any harm, and he'll also rescue us if we ever get into trouble. If we look to Jesus as our shepherd. Amen. We'll see you guys. Have a good time at Junior Church. We have some important announcements this morning. And um, I am going to... Uh, we need to make sure parents sign in their children every week. 
when they go to junior church. Just a reminder about that. And now we're going to have a couple of important announcements. Uh, Nikki, do you want to come first? Good morning. My name is Nikki. This Wednesday, we're having a prayer evening from 7 till 8.30. It likely may not go to, right all the way till 8.30, so we're just going to leave that open. Um, prayer nights are sometimes tough for those of you who are introverts, which I'm aware, I'm married to one, so I, um, in case the idea of praying out loud or whatever fills you with trepidation and, you know, angst, um, the way that evening will be formatted is when you come, we have the small half of the room, so it'll be a little quieter and a little, just so that we're better able to focus. There are three areas that we're going to be praying for, so I'll have the stations set up, and on each station is the topic so we know what our focus is and that's our board and leadership so I just have to backtrack a little the prayer night we've loved having Terry with us his term is coming to an end in June and then now we've started our search for a new pastor so our focus of the prayer night then is that while we now have our church profile and, and pastor profile is out there along with the job listing job posting um, it's important the documents are there, but we also need to put our hearts there too. So, we really, it's important to come together and just recognize what a challenging time this will be after Terry moves on, and for Terry too, um, but what a challenging time this will be for our church. So, it's important to um, come together, even if you're not a prayer, you know, even if that's not you, you like, Oh no, I'm good, thanks, prayer night, you know, but please come, please come, show up, and stand with us. Not that I, you know, I get emotional, but physically being here, very important, very important. So even if you are not the one comfortable praying out, that's okay. Each prayer station, a prayer station for board and leadership, for our new pastor, whoever that is, God has someone in mind, our new pastor and his family and for what that means for him or her. <clears throat> and then also for our church during that time. So those three stations will be set up and along with each table with the focus so that we can, uh, of what we're praying for, is I'm just gonna have some scriptures out as well and I'm gonna print them in big, don't worry. And they'll be out on every table. And so for those who are more comfortable praying, not out loud, that's okay. You'll have the scripture in front of you and you can be praying that along with whoever it is that, that's praying out. So we're just going to move from table to table, probably 10, 15 minutes each. You know, it's not a long thing. We'll open the evening in prayer. We'll go through the, our three focuses of prayer stations there. And we'll have a little bit of time after where I'll probably bring some tidbits or something, I don't know. And then we can close the evening in prayer. So if, um, if that sounds like where your heart is at, and I do hope it is. That's happening Wednesday at 7, and um, till about 8 or 8.30, however that looks to wrap that up. And I very much look forward to sharing that time with you all. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. And now Brittany. And she's going to give you an announcement, but I'm an interviewer. <laughs> We have uh, a very important all-church event coming up uh, next Saturday, and uh, it is called the Plan to Protect Training? Yes. Certification. Certification. What is the Plan to Protect? All right, and with that, I'm going to read this right here just because I want to make sure I got my words right. So the Plan to Protect Certification is required for anybody working or volunteering here at our church. Plan to Protect provides the highest standard of abuse prevention with the goal to equip us with extensive abusive um, prevention training tools and support to ensure that children, youth, those with disabilities, and vulnerable adults are all protected. Protection and care. And so it sounds to me like maybe only some people need to take this. Maybe just caregivers here at the church or I, I don't know, who is this for? It's for everybody. So <laughs> thanks for asking, Terry. <laughs> it's for everyone. <laughs> so 
for everybody here. Um, there's going to be many awesome events coming through in the life of our church, and who knows which ones you have a heart for that God lays on your heart to get involved in. So each one of those, whether it's greeting, whether it's on for worship, reading a scripture, any of those pieces, we want to make sure that we all are on the same page and giving that best care. Well, I'm going to interrupt you and just say that I know there's a backyard Bible club coming in the summer, which is going to be, uh, have an opportunity for volunteers for all kinds of things. Who knows? It's true. Who knows? We don't. You, we don't, we don't yeah. know. <laughs> all right, what are the, how, how, what's the commitment here? What's the time? Is there going to be food and all that other stuff? <laughs> there's going to be food. <laughs> there's always going to be food. So yeah, it's going to be this Saturday from 10 a.m. till 1230 here at the school. It's an online webinar. We'll have tables set up. There'll be coffee, there'll be food, all those things. So as you are here, you can snack away. And also there will be um, laptops on the side as well for us to make sure that we all get our um, criminal record checks done too, all at the same time. So it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy, one event, and it all is taken care of. Do we need to sign up? And if we do need to sign up, how and where and when, and can it be done today? It can. Who knew? So, <laughs> so it can be done today. And it's just as easy as either coming and seeing me following the service or online in our newsletter that has been sent out and on our church website, because we have that now, is a live link to an Eventbrite um, event where you can just RSVP on there. I believe we have it fixed now. So um, once you do that, there's no cost involved. Um, we will be taking care of all of that as our church because we want you involved. And God is so excited to see where our church is going. So, yeah, just RSVP online or see me if online is not a thing for you. And I signed up, so it must be working. <laughs> um, and also, I would also say, I think I could add, that this is just a way we show that we care for people. Uh, especially the people that are going to gather here at our church for various activities, Sundays, but other events. And it's a way we can love and care and show that we uh, want to protect and, uh, you know, give our best and be a safe place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jody. Good morning, church. Good to see everybody this morning. I'm Jody, for those that don't know me, but I think most of you do. Um, we're going to postpone a wonderful little event that we were trying to plan for Miss Brittany, a baby shower. It's supposed to happen on Tuesday. Oh, wait a minute. The pastoral uh, prayer meeting was the next night. That might be overkill for most people. So we are going to postpone it until we can see that lovely bundle of joy in June. I believe it's the 25th. Same place, I think. No, we're going to have it in this area so we can have the kitchen. We'll make more announcements when it gets closer to it. So, um, And the other announcement was at uh, Ladies Ministry, we had a, a lovely idea of, of supporting a young family that Crystal works with at the university. And um, everybody was coming up to me afterwards like, oh, you know, Natalie was going to make the basket and Yvonne was going to do the card. We're just going to hold fast until Crystal gets a bit more information about this young family. I believe there's like four kids under four, uh, twins included in that. So uh, we're going to try to get a basket together, but we're just going to get a little bit of information. So just hold tight, uh, basket and card makers and people that wanted to bring their stuff in. It's going to happen. We're just going to see where it takes us and we'll get some more information from Crystal when she has it. I think that's it. I'll back to you, Terry. <laughs> Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. John 10 beginning at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. That passage of scripture that we just read is being heard in thousands of churches around the world today on this fourth Sunday of Easter. Not, not every church, but many thousands. It's, it's not only one of the most famous metaphors in the Bible, it's also one of the most beloved images in the Christian world. It connects with Old Testament imagery about God as shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, writes David. He leads me beside still waters. In the catacombs under the streets of Rome, some of the earliest Christian art depicts Jesus with a shepherd's staff and caring for lambs. It's a lovely image. It's comforting. It's pleasant. It's peaceful. But notice this. Psalm 23 that Rachel read a bit of this morning is actually about assurance of God's care in the midst of danger, darkness, and death. And note the irony of etched drawings of a shepherd, a staff, a lamb across his shoulders in those dank, dark catacombs under the streets of Rome where Christians were hiding from murderous persecutors. You might be wondering, why, why are we reading a story where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd in this season of Easter? Well, in verse 17, Jesus says, he lays down his life in order to take it up again. He's the good shepherd who's willing to lay down his life for the flock. That's Good Friday. But takes it up again. That's Easter. Verse 18, no one takes my life from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. Easter's resurrection. So today we both acknowledge that there's good news. Jesus is our shepherd. But we're also acknowledging that we are sheep. And we sometimes go astray. But there's an oddness, isn't there, in this metaphor of Jesus as a shepherd. Although the world still has real shepherds in it, most of us hardly know what it's like to be one. I mean, unless I don't know you well. <laughs> I come from Calgary, where for 10 days every July, everyone dresses up like a cowboy and pretends. But 99% of us have no idea what real cowboys do. We know far more about teachers and mechanics and doctors and counselors and business people than we do about shepherds. Well, the rest of the metaphor is that we are like sheep. That one I get a little better. It seems a bit easier for us. We're, we're prone to wander. We get lost. We're vulnerable to predators. We aren't all that smart, especially when it comes to a herd mentality. We're vulnerable to flavor of the moment influencers. One of my favorite, Karen, maybe this is dating me, but uh, I used to be a big fan of the Gary Larson Far Side cartoons. 
And one of my favorite cartoons of his uh, showed a bunch of sheep at a house party and says one sheep to another, Henry, our party's in total chaos. Nobody knows when to eat, where to stand, what to, oh, thank goodness, there's a border collie <laughs> as the door opens and a dog appears. All joking aside, we may not know much about shepherds and sheep, but I think we all know what it feels like to be cared for. Each and every one of us yearns for someone to care for us, someone we can trust, someone who will advocate for us, someone we can turn to when the wolves show up, someone who, in the words of St. Augustine, loves us like we were the only one. And that's made Jesus' main point in our reading today from this fairly famous passage in John's 10th chapter. There are some, says Jesus, who claim to be shepherds and say they care, but they really don't. They're not good shepherds. They're not good they promise they'll care for you, but they really don't. If you take a look at the way John puts his gospel together, he didn't actually put any chapter breaks, like 1, 2, 3, 10, and so forth. That's not in the original documents. That's not how it was originally written. There's really no break in the story between chapters 9 and 10. When Jesus proclaims that I am the good shepherd, it's actually the final piece of a story that begins in chapter 9. Now, I don't have time to read the whole thing, but let me give you the quick summary of chapter 9. Jesus has just healed a man born blind, and he does it on the Sabbath. That's trouble. The Pharisees get wind of the miracle, and they're offended that Jesus breaks the rules of working on the Sabbath. Not that he healed this blind man, but that they mixed some water and dirt and made mud. That was the work. They even try to get the man who's healed to say that Jesus is a sinner. Seemingly oblivious to the fact that he doesn't care one way or the other. He says, look, I don't know and I don't care. All I know is once I was blind, but now I can see. That's in chapter 9. And it gets worse. The Pharisees blame the victim. They kick him out of the synagogue. They're more worried about their own authority being undermined than they are giving God glory for this miraculous healing. And they don't want to acknowledge the authority of Jesus. Near the end of chapter 9, the blind man finds Jesus and he acknowledges him and he worships him. Jesus tells him, these words, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. And Jesus, you know, the Pharisees are incredulous. They say, uh, 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 Jesus, surely you're not saying that we are spiritually blind. And Jesus tells them that their, blind, their proud refusal to admit their own spiritual blindness means that they are, in fact, sinners. Well, I tell you all of that simply to say this. All of that comes just before Jesus says, I am a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And as he does that, the Pharisees are standing right in front of him. It's a stinging, in-your-face moment. You can snip that story out of its original context and maybe put it on a Hallmark card and call it Words of Comfort from Jesus. But I want to assure you that the original hearers of those words, I am a good shepherd, did not hear it that way. Those were inflammatory words. They made them hot with anger. You could have cut the tension with a knife. Jesus is saying, you're no better than the hired hands. You're not shepherds at all. 
You're leaving the people God promised to shepherd to the wolves. You're no better than thieves. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own know me. And I call them by name. And they recognize my voice. Wow. It's quite a story. The whole story. I believe most people in our society are looking for a good shepherd. They probably wouldn't say they're looking for a savior in the con conventional evangelical sense. But I would say that just like us, they're looking for people who will help make their lives better. For political saviors who promise to save us from our economic and social fears. For relationship advisors and social media influencers, influencers who will save us heartache and unlock the missing magic for us. Or the next drug, or the next procedure, or diet that will keep us youthful and vital and attractive. The list goes on. But truly, how many of our political and social and economic systems are designed for care? Designed to genuinely care for us. I know I'm gonna sound like such a cynic, but we all know that there's almost always an angle. Are those promises really about caring for us or are they buying our vote? Can you really trust those online reviews? What about those influencers' posts? Online influencers aren't paid for making a difference in one person's life. Do you know what they're paid, how they're paid? By attracting a voluminous amount of website traffic to their, to their site. This past week, there was a news story about registered dietitians giving online advice using the influencer business model, doing sponsored content or paid partnerships with brands and industry groups. Yikes. <laughs> you know, and to top it all, here's, here's also another painful, I, I know I'm, I'm big on the pain before the, the joy. <laughs> but you know what's really sad is when you have a worst case scenario. When you have an institution in, like in Canada, where we would have, say, a healthcare system. Systems that are intended to provide care. And then they break down. And, and it's no one's fault in particular. It's, it's deep, it's systemic, it's complex. No one wants it, no one's happy about it. There's no angle. And the very people who've given their lives to care my wife is one of them. It becomes so discouraging. It's discouraging to everybody. I heard a story this week about a, a girl in Kamloops who raised $1,500 selling lemonade so that her sister could get a private autism assessment because the public system was going to take three years. It's just heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking. Does anyone really care? The danger of looking for saviors in some of these places is, is that all we get are hired hands. The ones they, that say they care but really don't. Only good shepherds really care. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. See, the Pharisees that Jesus has been sparring with obviously don't see Jesus as a good shepherd. They're spiritually blind. They cannot see. Let me uh, switch sensory modalities now from sight to hearing. They don't hear or recognize the shepherd's voice. The, Jesus says that the good shepherd calls his sheep by name and they follow him because they know his voice. And when you read the New Testament and the Gospels, one of Jesus' deepest teachings concerns the manner in which we hear. 
Jesus often alerts his listeners to the fact that they may not be using their ears simply for listening and understanding, but for other purposes as well, such as to filter and manage the message so that it fits in with their own lives and purposes. We do that, right? We listen for what we want to hear. For Jesus, the way we use our very senses of sight and hearing is a reflection of our hearts and our character. That is one of the most consistent messages of Jesus in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, Jesus says of those who simply don't want to hear what God has to say, that they look, but they do not perceive. And they may indeed listen, but they do not understand so that they may not turn again, repent, and be forgiven. So here's a question for all of us. If we know our Good Shepherd is the one who cares for us, why do we sometimes turn to these other hired hands? Especially in our times of need. Could it be that sometimes we forget that we are not our own? That we belong to someone besides ourselves. See, that was the Pharisees' problem. They did not submit to Jesus and his authority. The fact is that submitting to one who knows us intimately, who knows our secrets, who knows our hearts, who knows our desires, that can be very hard for us if we are used to hiding parts of ourselves from others. We just may not want to hear from a good shepherd because we want to run our lives without any interference from God. Unless we're in a heap of trouble. In uh, Dallas Willard's very fine book called Hearing God, Developing a Conversational Relationship with God, he speculates that very few human beings have a concrete desire to hear what God has to say to them. He says, we rarely listen for his voice when we're not in trouble or when we're not being faced with a decision we don't know how to handle. Let me quote him. He says this, people who understand and warmly desire to hear God's voice will, by contrast, want to hear it when life is uneventful just as much as they want to hear it when they're facing trouble or big decisions. This is a test we should all apply to ourselves as we go in search of God's word. Do we seek it only under uncomfortable circumstances? Our answer may reveal that our failure to hear his voice when we want to is due to the fact that we do not in general want to hear it and that we want it only when we think we need it. Ooh, wow. That's a prophetic word, isn't it? A prophetic word about the importance of prayer. About cultivating uneventful listening to God in our lives. About submitting our lives to Jesus in practices that have a rhythm of dailiness and weakliness and regularity, all so that we can grow to be familiar with his voice, and so that we can recognize his voice when he speaks, because Jesus is a good shepherd, and he does speak. It's what good shepherds do. And this need to listen is not just for individuals, it's for churches as well. You know, it didn't take me long when I got here last September. Boy, the time has flown, been flying by. It didn't take me long when I got here in September to realize that this, we are a praying church. We take prayer seriously, and we need to. We need to take it seriously if we're going to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd in our community and be a Good Shepherd community ourselves. It's why we pray on Wednesdays. It's why we pray in our small groups. It's why we pray at our meetings. We pray in weekly worship. I mean, imagine if 
we weren't a praying church. I'm wondering if we would hear a word from the Lord if we, when we're in trouble. When we need to make a big decision. Because there's always more big decisions coming. Why would we not trust the Good Shepherd? Why would we not trust the Good Shepherd? Friends, here is wonderful news for today. Even though, as the prophet Isaiah says, all we are like sheep and have gone astray. Even so, the Good Shepherd will leave the 99 that are found to rescue us. His commitment to us is hard to fathom. He takes an exceptional interest in us, yes. He gathers us when we are scattered, protects us from the wolves, from the hired hands and the thieves, yes. But then there's the big one, telling us that he lays down his life for his sheep. Three times in our reading today, he says, I have, I'm willing to die for my sheep. Why would we think anyone else would care for us like Jesus? Well, there's a final hopeful word in our reading today. And it comes near the end of our reading, in verse 16. Jesus says this. I have other sheep. Did you, did you hear that part? I have other sheep. They're not in the fold right now. They're not of this fold. But I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. What does that mean? What could Jesus mean by that? Contextually, Jesus is likely talking about bringing the Gentiles into the church. Because at the time that John writes this gospel, in the first century... The transition is underway from being a Jewish-centered church to expanding and becoming a church for all non-Jews. And that's what the Bible calls Gentiles. A Gentile is any non-Jew. So those inside the sheepfold would be Jewish Christians. But Jesus is saying that his work is not finished until all are welcomed into the sheepfold. Jesus intends to draw all people to himself. Over 2,000 years since Jesus first uttered those words, God continues to seek out people from every walk of life, across cultures, across traditions, from every generation, and leads them into his fold. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. There will be one flock and one shepherd. Now here's the thing. Neither Jesus nor John prescribes in any clear way what the boundaries of the fold are. That's interesting. One flock, one shepherd. If we take Jesus' words seriously then the members who will one day constitute God's one flock, the flock of whom Jesus is the one shepherd, that's going to exceed our imagining. Some like to think they know who's in and who's out of the fold, but there's a humility, there's a hope, there's an expansiveness, there's an inclusiveness in Jesus' statement that is truly humbling. And it's consistent with all that Jesus says and does in the Gospels. All that we can know for sure is that the risen Jesus is not done gathering his sheep yet. Isn't that good to know? Isn't that good to know that God continues to seek his sheep? Maybe you know some of them. <laughs> Maybe we know some. And we hope for them. And Jesus will not stop. He will lay down his life. He will not stop until they've been gathered in. Friends, for anyone in our world today who wonders, does anyone care? This is the resurrection hope of Jesus unleashed in our world today. There is a good shepherd who is calling and won't stop calling and searching for his sheep 
until there is that one flock. Reminds me of John's vision in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. At the end of history, John sees people worshiping around the throne. John says he sees a multitude that no one can count. People from every nation, every tribe, every ethnicity, every language, and all of them bowing down before the Lamb on the throne saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, but I will call them by name, and they'll hear my voice. This is the word of the Lord, and it is true. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Searching and tireless shepherd. You make it your business to know us and call us by our names. Yes, we, we stray and we get lost, and at times we're selective listeners. And we like our independence. When we hide from you, come and find us. When we're lost, keep tracking us down. When we're limping or in pain, Set us on your shoulders. Make us feel your touch and your confidence and bring us home to the fold. When we fail to hear your voice, help us to submit to deeper and more fervent prayer so that we'll recognize your voice, your direction, your correction if it's needed, and especially your presence amongst us. Lord, we know you hear the voice of your sheep in our congregation who need care today, the care of your healing and your wholeness for ones who are not well, think of Jermaine and Daryl this morning, others whom are known by you, who are ailing, who are struggling in health. Send your loving mercy, we pray, on your children who have no sheepfold, those who never feel safe, those who mistakenly believe that there's no one who cares. Help us to be the community of the Good Shepherd, to reach out your arm of mercy to those who are outside of the sheepfold. Bless all for whom our church and our social circles look like a sheep pen with very high walls around it. Help us to be the Good Shepherd community. To be a place where the loving care of Jesus is what inflames our love for neighbors in our neighborhoods. We give you thanks this morning for our good shepherd Jesus, for who's, who's laid his life down for our sakes. Thank you for the hope and the confidence we have and the amazing grace of our shepherd king. Grace that goes ahead of us and is going ahead of us even now to those who, whom we love and care about who aren't in the sheepfold. Draw these dear ones into the one flock and into the loving embrace of the one shepherd. We pray all these things this morning through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Green pastures, he makes me. Love. 
Come and gather at the table um, and receive the bread and the cup. Uh, we'll do it like this today. I'll invite you to come down the center aisle where Craig and I will serve the bread and the cup to you. And then if you'll take the bread and the cup and return to your seats and wait, we'll eat and drink together when all have been served. If you'd like to stay right where you are, um, we'll come and serve you. And uh, so just wait for that. We believe that communion, the Lord's table, is a holy meal and a feast of thanksgiving. It remembers the death and the resurrection of Jesus by which he conquered sin and death and makes our communion with God possible. Psalm 103 expresses this joy and this thanksgiving for what God has done. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The communion table is open to all who sincerely love God and desire to follow Jesus. 
It's for sinners in need of God's grace and forgiveness who come to themselves and turn to God. And it's for strength for the journey. So we come to the table this morning with humble hearts, confident that we will receive true food and drink from Jesus for our souls. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord. Amen. night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in an upper room, he took some bread, and after giving thanks for it, blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this bread is my body broken for you. Eat this and remember me. Let's eat together. And after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks for it, he said, This cup is my blood shed for you. And with it, God makes a new covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember me. Let's pray. God, pour out your spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ. 
redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in service and love to all of this world, so hungry to be cared for and loved. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Remember this, the Good Shepherd, he looks for us, he finds us, he gathers us, he feeds us, he protects us, and he knows us by name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.